Thank you, sir. I was going to start with a solo bongra act, but you guys totally stole my thunder. So instead, I'm going to talk to you about storytelling and storytellers, and how advances in technology have created a higher level of interactivity, and thus a deeper level of engagement with stories, both for audiences and those who create stories. I'm going to be clicking this. There it is. Don't overshoot. I'll be talking about this through how, first, how we deliver stories, how we access, how we tell stories, and then looking at where these different deliveries intersect, where they play with each other, where it gets really messy, and where that engagement filters in, resulting in the formation of real life communities. Uh, my background, get this clicker. My background, I'm the co owner of AV Adventure Productions, we're an interactive storytelling company. Uh, we do interactive events for groups of all ages, entertainment, education, teamwork. Our delivery platforms include mobile devices, internet video, outdoor theater, and headphones. And what I'm talking to you today about is multi-platform storytelling. And what I mean by that is storytelling that can happen through multiple devices or platforms. And by platforms, I mean anything that can tell a story. Uh, we're all very familiar with television, movies, music, uh, but a letter, a photograph, a physical interaction, a piece of theater, uh, all these things are platforms for telling story. And it's the place where these all intersect that gets really exciting. There's a buzzword for this, it's transmedia. This is a word that was born of necessity for conversation about this topic a few years ago. The idea being that we can tell stories specifically designed to utilize these platforms simultaneously. The thing that differentiates transmedia from something like multi-platform storytelling or cross-platform storytelling is in transmedia, all the different platforms are unique and serve a purpose to play to the overall story or story world. So if I had a movie and I watched it on my TV at home, and then I got on the bus and watched it on my iPad, those are two different platforms, but that's not a transmedia experience. Something like the NBC show Heroes is a transmedia experience. Most people are familiar with it as an NBC television program. But those who are diehard fans could also get into the backstories of the characters through an online series, or track villains through online games, or read graphic novels that gave away content of the show before it even aired. All of these platforms had dedicated content that was unique and allowed users to dive into that story world. Another example is the sci-fi program Defiance. It's coming out next month. It's not even out yet. And they are building this from the ground up to be a simultaneous television show and video game experience. Content from the TV show will affect the video game in real time and vice versa, allowing for a unique way to engage with the narrative. Now, this idea of transmedia, transmedia is not new, the, the core idea of it. The word is, and the word is something we use to talk about these things in the field. But the idea of stories being told across multiple platforms and through all different ways has kind of been around forever. Um, very big brands have been kings of transmedia without ever asking for the label. Star Wars, for example. Everybody's familiar with the Star Wars movies, the music, the video games, the Star Wars everything. It's a joke, you know, it's a joke to the point where the marketing, the Star Wars inflatable, Star Wars cereal, burgers. It's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, in the 80s movie, Spaceballs, a parody of Star Wars onto itself, there's a scene wherein um, they mock the marketing of Star Wars through Spaceballs. It's like, Spaceballs is a flamethrower. They go, and there's really this culture of Everything in that story can be delivered on any platform available. And so Star Wars is an incredible piece of transmedia. Sesame Street's a great example of one from an educational standpoint. Um, you can see Sesame characters and stories across all kinds of disciplines, and it's used for educational purpose. And transmedia is really great for delivering educational experiences. When some people hear transmedia, they think of this new idea, this idea of using platforms that maybe aren't everyday type things, GPS coordinates, archaic technologies, payphones, to create engaging experiences that involve audiences in a way beyond television or movies. The Why So Serious campaign was a promotional campaign for the Dark Knight film that had fans of Batman running around, finding clues in the real world and online, sending photos of themselves and characters. Um, they were eventually tracking down 22 bakeries around the country and ripping open cakes that had cell phones inside them to call characters, all resulting in a secret screening of the film. The Year Zero project from Nine Inch Nails hid USB drives with secret audio messages and unreleased music in bathroom stalls at concerts that no one knew were there. 
and they just naturally let people discover this and share this and tell these stories and invest their deepest fans into the narrative in a way that they couldn't just do, saying, hey, this is our new album. It's kind of interesting. It's cool like that. <laughs> Access is key. You know, everybody gets a bad rap with their smartphone and their iPad and their TV. We get so many devices. It's becoming a digital world. Nobody's interacting with each other anymore. And I'm kind of trying to look at the other side of that here. We do have so much access to all different ways to consume and tell stories, but this is incredibly exciting because it enables everyone to be more so a storyteller and more so to access everybody else's story. And in doing that, we're creating a greater level of engagement with those narratives and each other. That's why transmedia is important. I'd like to focus on two platforms in particular and how they relate to story because they're kind of unique and fun. One of which is social media. Everyone's incredibly familiar with Facebook. I would assume a lot of people in this room have Facebook accounts. Facebook is weird, right? Um, you can be on Facebook, yeah, it's super weird. And this is, I went to TED and learned Facebook it was weird. Um, you can see on Facebook that someone's engaged and then you can not acknowledge that in any way. And then two months later, see them on the street and say, how's the wedding coming along? And that is socially acceptable. Because, <laughs> right? It's super weird. Because anything that's put into that social sphere is taken as an open dialogue to the world. You're putting it out there and you're putting this persona of yourself. And it could be something like, I'm engaged and everybody should know this and maybe I'm not gonna tell you. But there's also, you guys all have Facebook friends. You have the one that like, every time they go to the gym, they're like, oh, I exercise so much. I must be super fit. Or the one that's always like taking photos of themselves. I'm so cute. I look like a celebrity. Everybody should know how much I get complimented. Or like, I'm so tired because I've been working so hard. Woe is me, right? You're able to put the identity of whatever you want online. You're telling your own story. And the rules are endless and not even there. And it's crazy and scary and horrifying. Yes, that's, that's real. Um, so. That Facebook is, is exciting as a storytelling device, but it's incredibly personal and maybe troublesome for the overall narrative. Instagram's another version of this. If I go on your Instagram account, which you, know, you post photos, it's all about just sharing photos with people, and I see a bunch of different travel locations. Well, that tells me, well, you're well-traveled. Well, you're going to a bunch of places that a lot of people can't go to. Good for you. Oh, that's pretty. Or you have, you know, like, this is the narrative you're telling me. Or, oh, look, you're eating foods that look nice, and you can take pictures of them. And everybody has, who's on Instagram has either been guilty or knows someone who's guilty of posting pretty food photos. This tells me that apparently you make nice decisions in the aesthetic photos. I want to see the person who posts dirty food on the floor, because to me, this tells a story. I don't need to see the Thai food you eat that's pretty. I want to hear why you ate the peanut butter that fell on the floor, because that's an engaging story. Twitter is super weird too, yes. Uh, the spectrum of Twitter ranges from the most grave and important and serious things to the most mundane and throwaway ideas. When Osama bin Laden's um, compound was raided, the first notification to the world that this was happening was a tweet from someone who heard that helicopter and didn't know what it was. And from here, the conversation spiraled, and the world was ever able to piece together this incredibly secret operation as it happened. On the other hand, you could take a tweet out of context from the back of the Williamsburg Gazette and just put it to the internet, and it doesn't have much value inherently. It's really exciting right there. If anybody is live tweeting this, just for the sake of story, using the hashtag, please just tell people, I'm talking about like quantum physics or like Mexican food, <laughs> just confuse them and break that Twitter story because that's super exciting to me. Um, and YouTube, real briefly, YouTube has the terminology of a television station. You have episodes, you have channels, you have subscribers. It sounds like TV, it sounds like cable. And it enables anyone with access to those devices to tell stories to create their version of a TV experience. And that's really empowering and is only going to get crazier as more people have access to cameras. The other platform I'm really excited about is this idea of physical space. Beyond people running into bakeries to rip up cakes, there are some really fantastic dedicated physical space transmedia experiences. There's this play in New York called Sleep No More. It's an interpretation of Macbeth as done through Hitchcock's style and music, all done in a warehouse that is converted into a noir hotel. And the actors run through the space physically, acting out scenes and doing crazy choreography. And as an audience member, you're given a mask, told to stay silent, and you choose your path. You can follow Macbeth all the, the whole time, or you could just rifle through desks, read letters, eat candy off a shelf, hide behind a plant. Like, you do whatever you want while you're in there. And it creates this really engaging mix of physical space, music, and other set dressings to create a very immersive experience. 
So what's the point? We have all these devices, we have all these ways to tell stories. It's this messy point where they all kind of get together and they blur the lines, as Kaveh was saying, you know. This, we're all about blurring the lines here and that's what's going on with these devices. And when you can create these weird worlds between them, you create really memorable stories. I'd like to highlight quickly a few techniques on how we blur the lines and make these stories more engaging. I believe the idea of choice and consequence within narrative is critical to delivering an essential story experience to the participants. Um, the act of making decisions within a story and seeing how they play out for the individual, for the audience and the characters is a really key way to get people engaged with a narrative. One way to do choice and consequence is with morality. You see this a lot in video games like the Bioshock series or the Mass Effect series where the person who's playing a character on the screen has to make choices. You can make the good guy choice or the bad guy choice. And those kind of things at the end are like, oh, you got the good ending, you got the bad ending. And that's a little linear. It's still in its infancy. But there was this game last year called The Walking Dead, based off the comics and TV show. It racked up over 80 Game of the Year awards from critics across the board, which in this medium is mind-blowing. Because this game is not like a run around, gun everything, only for the home. You can play this on your phone or on your TV in your living room. And you're not shooting things and exploding them. The majority of the game is spent having conversations with people and deciding how things play out. You pick who's going to eat food. You pick who's going to live through the zombie experience. Someone gets in a fight. You decide who's right and whose side to take. It gets to the point where maybe you're sent out to do something. And depending on how nice you were and the decisions you made, that could play out at least eight different ways on if you're going to the next game of the section with any, next section of the game with any help. And it's absolutely a great example and has brought the conversation of narrative and story in the video game medium back to the forefront in this year more so than it has been since video games came to be. It's pretty wild. Another example is alternate endings. You guys are familiar with these? For an old example, Sheer Madness has been running since the 60s. It's a play. It's a um, murder mystery set in a barbershop where the audience gets to pick who killed them and gets to interview the audience and the ending's always different and going on the fly. And this has been around forever because of this engaging, because of the, able to, you know, the ability to change this on the fly. Clue, the movie Clue that came out, and in the spirit of its other platform, a board game, they shipped it to theaters with different endings. And depending on what theater you went, you had a different movie experience. It was something to engage with, something to talk about. Um, it's alternate endings. And then branching paths. The visual that's best for these is those old school choose your own adventure books. And you know, you have a story, you can go one way, you can go another, and you can see how your own story unfolds. But probably an ultimate example of a bridging path narrative these days is American Idol. And the stakes are really high here. In American Idol, millions upon millions of people vote, and you're not only changing this overall narrative on television, but you're changing the narrative of the actual lives and careers of the people on that show. It's pretty high stakes. Um, another way to blur the lines is this question of authorship and audience. Where does the audience and author's jobs begin and end? On the TV show Survivor in early seasons, diehard fans were so into it that they got to the point where they were using real life detective work, calling hotels on set and satellite imagery to figure out where the show was going, who was getting kicked off, what the challenges were, who won them. And as a result, the producers had to change the way they made TV. They had to start throwing false leads. They had to mix up the way they edited. They had to change the channel of production between when they filmed and when they put it on television, all because of audience interaction. Um, other examples, ravenous, that's probably not the right word, ravenous fan communities, you may be familiar with things like Family Guy and Futurama, shows that existed on TV were canceled, came onto a different platform through DVD for home use, and the audience reaction was so strong that they got back to their first platform, and then they went everywhere else because of it. Um, or here's an example where the show Chuck on NBC was canceled, or about to be canceled, and the fans were like, we don't want it to be canceled, what can we do, what movement can we start? And so they took the main sponsor of the show, Subway, and they're like, well, we're just going to eat a hell of a lot of Subway sandwiches and show everybody. So, <laughs> so, that's, so we had Chuck fans coming out of the woodwork to meet each other in real life to eat Subway sandwiches, interact with the characters, and got the attention of the broadcasters and saved their show through eating Subway sandwiches. It's amazing. The last way I'd like to talk about blurring the lines, and this is the most exciting to me personally, is this idea of the stories born of stories. And when you interact with a narrative or a story experience that is so fantastic and so affecting that you have to share it with somebody else. It's like, I just did this thing called Sleep No More. I ran around the warehouse. Somebody accidentally shoved me into a cabinet. Oh, I played The Walking Dead. This thing happened to me. Did it happen to you? Let's go eat subs. I love Chuck. You know, like, 
when you're rifling through bathroom stalls looking for USB drives, you are highly engaged in a story narrative, and it's something that you're going to tell other people. And you're going to tell them on these devices, on these phones, on these tablets, on these meeting them face to face. And so think of it like a big web that spreads where you have this story and then you tell a story and someone else tells a story. And it creates this giant web of storytelling. And that's where all the engagement comes in is all those intersections where people are telling stories about stories and we have so many tools with which to do it. And the big cool side effect of all this is in that web we're creating communities. Some are web based, some are in real life, and some are a great intersection of the two of them. But these devices that often get a bad rap for isolating us and being told we're all going alone and no one's going to be able to talk to each other in the future are really being used in some really amazing ways to bring people together and create a sense of community um, that is really worth paying attention to. So thanks for your time, and uh, have a good TED. Thank mm -hmm. you.